right. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, I am so excited to have my friend and brilliant entrepreneur, um, Kieran Krishnan here from Microbiome Labs. And we're going to talk all things gut health and probiotics today. And you guys have heard me now for many, many um, years talk about spores. Um, what's interesting is I'm going to introduce uh, Kieran in just a moment, but I want to tell you really quick how my history relates to this because 20 years ago, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease and I didn't have a clue at the time. I remember my doctor telling me I had to have, uh, you know, surgery, steroids, immune modulating drugs. And he said, Jill diet has nothing to do with it. Right. And I remember, you know, I was a third year medical student, so I didn't know a whole lot, but I knew like that didn't feel right. That was like, didn't make sense. And again, I didn't feel like I had all the answers, but I was going to find them. And I dug deep, came across specific carbohydrate diet, and I made some changes. And within two weeks, my fevers, my symptoms were gone. Now it took me probably two years to heal from Crohn's. And I consider myself today completely healed hundred percent, like cured, not, not in remission. I'm cured. And people kind of balk at that because they're told it's incurable, but I'm living proof. Now, what does this have to do with probiotics? Well, Karen, I don't know if you even know this, but um, back in the day, I remember bacillus coagulans and I was like, uh, I don't know what this is, but this is the only probiotic I can tolerate. And back then there was not many on the market. <laughs> right. And I remember thinking, okay, whatever this bacillus thing is, this is the one. And I literally for 20 years have been on spores and it has been a game changer in my um, health and in my whole gut. And I always now, even on the toughest guts, I always go to spores. Now we're going to dive in today. I cannot wait to talk all things spores and the latest research. But I wanted to kind of set it up because I have always been a fan of yours. I've always been such a big proponent of Megaspore. Um, spoke for you guys, continue to share the word. And of course, we sell your products. Um, I'm such a fan, partially because of my own story of healing is so intricately related to spores. So I wanted to share that. Um, and let me introduce my guest. Uh, Kieran Christian is a research microbiologist and has been involved in the dietary supplement and nutrition market for the past 18 years. He comes from a university research background, having spent several years with hands-on R&D in the fields of molecular medicine and microbiology at the University of Iowa. Kieran established a clinical research organization where he designed and conducted dozens of human clinical trials in human nutrition. He's also co-founder and is a partner in the New Science Trading LLC, a nutritional technology development research company. He's also co-founder and chief scientific officer at Microbiome Labs. He's a frequent lecturer in the human microbiome uh, at the human uh, microbiome at medical and nutritional conferences. I've you know, heard him. We've been in the same circles for quite a while now um, and an expert guest on national and satellite radio. He's appeared in several international documentaries and a guest speaker on several international health summits as a microbiome expert. Um, Kieran, you're one of my favorite people to talk to because you just bring it down, bring the research. Like what I'm seeing in clinical practice, you kind of bring the um, pieces. I always like when I hear your lectures or we talk, um, I, it makes so much sense because it fits in the clinical practice. So first of all, welcome. Thank you for taking the time to talk to me here. I'm glad it's, to see you. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. I, um, I, I adore you. I'm a big fan of yours as well and um, always enjoy listening to you speak. So I, I jumped at the opportunity to have this conversation together in front of other people. So yeah. uh, it's super exciting and, and it's an exciting time that we live in. You know, there's so much going on in the world today and there's yeah. so much going on in science, <laughs> medicine and health um, that it's mind boggling, you know, for nerds like us, it's, it's yeah. <laughs> today you wake up and you're like, what the hell is this? We just discovered this. You know, it's, no. it's mind boggling to me what's going on in the world today. And the probiotic research is exponentially, I mean, back a decade ago, when well, two decades ago, when I started into it, like there was not that much and it's just yeah. exploded. And on the fronts of you and I know how it uh, relates to heart and obesity and diabetes and mood disorders and sleep disorders and testosterone deficiency, things that you would never think. But um, the science is just now catching up with what we've seen and known to be true. And there's so much out there. Um, what I want to start with before we dive into spores and what's the latest is how did you get into this? I obviously had a research background, but tell us your story about how Microbiome Labs came to be and how what was your role in that? Yeah, you know, um, I, and I never, I always kind of played a role behind the scenes because I did research for companies. I consulted for a lot of companies, helped them formulate products, helped them put together the science always in the background. Never did I think we would have a brand of our own that's out there in the marketplace, but it really was born out of a, out of an, um, a need that was out that existed. 
So we were actually hired by a large multinational company uh, who's in the dietary supplement space uh, back in around 2010. Mm -hmm. So they hired our research technology development company and, and their goal was for us to identify for them what is the next generation of probiotics, right? What, what is working in the industry? What's not working? Do they need to be refrigerated? Do they not? You know, is it 100 billion? Is it 200 billion? What, where are, is all of this stuff going, right? And they really wanted us to boil down which of the, the approaches in the probiotic side made sense and which didn't. Um, and so we went through two and a half, three years worth of study on the, on the probiotic marketplace. Yeah. We tested products, right? We looked for survivability of the products that are sitting there on the shelf or in the refrigerator, whether or not they can make it through the gastric system. We looked at efficacy studies. We looked at all kinds of things. Um, and we did a deep dive on the research to figure out, is there a rationale for going 100 billion, for example, right? A new product just came out yeah. and it's now 150 billion. What's the rationale behind right. that? Uh, you know, why is it 15 strains? Why not one? Why not two? And so we dug into all of that. And really what we came out with was there was a lot of nonsense in the industry, you know, uh, to put it lightly, right? And, and companies were being driven by market. And, you know, the, the way they came up with 100 billion is the closest competitor had 80 billion and they wanted to be 20 billion more. So it looks better, right? And the way they came up with 15 strains is the closest competitor had 12. And so it just became a race to uh, up the mountain for the biggest and baddest kind of product in that sense. Um, and then the refrigeration thing was, was a difficult thing because most of the refrigerated products didn't even really survive through the gastric system. So it didn't really matter. Um, you know, there were so many issues like that. And then we started thinking, okay, if there's a lot of issues with the, what, what people are using as probiotics, are there actual probiotic bacteria out there that meet the definition? Right. The scientific definition of a probiotic is it's a live microorganism when administered in adequate amounts confers a health benefit to the host. So it has to meet all of those criteria. It has to meet a live organism, b administered in adequate amounts. So you have to be able to dose it specifically. And then it has to confer a health benefit to the host. Most probiotics on the market fail the first step, which is not live organism, right? There was no dosing criteria that made any sense. And then they never, most companies didn't prove that their finished product had any health benefit to the host. So we said, well, what kind of bacteria could actually act as a probiotic? And then me being a closeted evolutionary biologist, even though I didn't study evolutionary biology, um, I always look to nature and go, okay, where did our ancestors get bacteria from? You know, where, what did they eat frequently? They gave them microbes. And, and you come to find out that they ate dirt, really, right? They ate, they ate off the land. They didn't sterilize their food and water and all that. So they got a lot of microbial exposure from, the, um, from their environment. That, however, is too simplified because then what, you, that what makes you conclude is, oh, okay, soil-based organisms. Let's just grab a bunch of those. And that's now a probiotic. Well, it's not that simple because the vast majority of organisms in the soil cannot survive through the gastric system, right? Because the gastric system is there acting as a barrier to prevent that from happening. And so we started going in and going, okay, what organisms are ubiquitous within the environment that we would accidentally swallow every day, but also had the unique capability to survive through the gastric system and make it into the intestines alive. So we can meet at least that first part of the definition and that's where we came up with the spores because they have this really unique coating around them, you know, the spore coat that protects them from harsh environments like the outside world and through the gastric system. And so we said, wow, okay, these are amazing. These are endo bacillus endospore forming bacteria. They meet the biggest part of the criteria. You know, humans have been consuming them for millions of years. So we've got a commensal relationship with them. They survive through the gastric system. We can, we can document dosage of these even upwards of a couple million years ago. And we started digging into it and we found they've been used in the pharmaceutical industry since 1952, wow. right? One of the first prescription probiotics launch is a bacillus uh, clausi, uh, which, is, which is still in the market today since 1952, wow. used for treating dysentery and upper respiratory yeah. tract infection. And so we're like, okay, amazing. Nobody's using these in the US supplement industry. This is the next generation of spores. And we went through and figured out all the right spores and where to get them and all of that. And then we came back to the company. Uh, this is two and a half, three years later. And we said, okay, guys, we figured it all out. 
right? All this stuff is nonsense here. Here's all the reasons why it's nonsense. Here's your new um, generation of probiotics. In fact, we basically handed them the formula for Megaspore and said, this is the next big thing. And here's the studies we would do yeah. because of it, right? And, and then they, you want to be sure and get you said, did you say two years or was it longer with all those? It was stuff? about two and a half years. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> close to three years at that point. Right. So it was, it was really kind of 2010 mm -hmm. to about middle or end of 2012. Okay. Um, we came back and at the time it seemed extremely disappointing, but they said, you know what? We just got acquired by a larger company and this is really interesting stuff, but no thanks. What I mean really with it. Right. And we were like, what the hell? Uh, yeah. This is so important, right? And and then we became so impassioned about it because now we knew that yeah. most of the stuff people are buying is just crap. It's yeah. not doing anything, right. Right? right? And this could really help them. So somebody, please do something with it. And we called up all of the companies I've worked with in yeah. the past, the large companies in our field, uh, in the retail side, and, and one after the other, they kept passing. The biggest thing that companies couldn't wrap their head around uh, which they had a really hard time is we were recommending a dose of 4 billion CFUs a day, right? And they're like, how am I going to sell 4 billion, yeah. right? My top selling probiotic is 30 billion. How am I going to tell my consumers, you have to pay the same for 4 billion. Yeah. And we're like, because it's not the it's quantity. Not, it's irrelevant. It's, it's irrelevant, right? And they're yeah. like, no, we can't do that. It doesn't make any sense. So everyone kept passing on it. And, and then we were like, okay, you know, I guess nobody's going to launch it. We'll go on to the next project. But Tom and I, uh, my business partner, we kept going back and forth and going, this is too important. We can't not get this out there. And so one day we and just- you met Tom through the research or had you known him for a long time? Like how did you- know, at, Yeah, at that point I'd known Tom, I think for about five or six years. Okay. Uh, and, the, and actually this kind of through research because um, in my other company, I was working with a gentleman, he's uh, a doctor, his name is John Abernathy. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a seasoned research professional um, associated with the University of Florida. And John and I had been working together for like 10 years before that doing studies together. And um, John always told me, he's like, my good buddy from high school, Tom lives in Chicago. You guys got to get together. You guys think about things in the same way and, you know, so similar and blah, blah. He kept encouraging us. So finally, Tom and I got together for lunch and Immediately, we're like, all right, we get it. You know, I think we're yeah, going to do totally something. Same together, mindset. Right? Yeah, same mindset, same motivations, right? And uh, we, we worked on a few projects together. It didn't really go go anywhere. But then when we had the spore thing where we were both like, this is too important. And Tom, you know, being a practitioner at the time, he was practicing almost full time. He's like, I can't use any other probiotics now. Now that I know yeah, all this stuff. I know. <laughs> but, right. He's like, I, I'm done. I'm done. I'm just going with the postbiotics. He was using that Sagan stuff all the time, you uh -huh. know, the really expensive postbiotics. Yeah. So that's all he was focusing on. And, and so we decided together, we're like, all right, we just get it. We just got to do this. You know, it's, it, it may, it'll probably fail. We don't know what the hell we're doing, you know, oh, we're I love it. ourselves, right. And <laughs> we're like, we're going to give ourselves, we basically had $80,000 to start the company. Oh, I love it. <laughs> that's it, right. That's yeah. all we had. Yeah. And, uh, and so we, we sat together and we go, okay, how do you market a product? Like, what do you do? You know, like you buy a Super Bowl commercial, we had yeah. no idea, right? And so we said, okay, let's go to what we know. We know Tom's a chiropractor, right? So we, we're like, okay, we know chiropractors. We know how they think. We know how to talk to them. So let's just go to chiropractic shows and do lectures and start to get the chiropractors excited about this new concept. And, um, and then the the only place in the U.S. where chiropractors have to be in a seat for to get their CEs is in Florida, uh -huh. right? So every other state in the country, you can they can do it online, and so the the shows aren't well attended. So we honed in on Florida and chiropractors. That's it, uh -huh. right? And so our very first show, the Florida Chiropractic Association, we got a booth, and uh, you know we we had we had this nice display, and we're standing there, two guys trying to talk to people, uh -huh. trying to get people's attention, right? People just walking by, don't know what the hell we're talking about. Uh, none of it's making sense to people. So we decided, all right, we got to do a lecture. Uh, and of course, nobody knew who we were, so we couldn't get on the, on the actual speaking roster. So we said, let's do a lunch-sponsored lecture, mm -hmm. right? Let's invite yeah. some of these pyros to lunch. Right. Uh, we'll pay for the whole thing. And, uh, and then the, the FCA said, okay, fine, you guys can do one lunch-sponsored lecture. So the first lunch-sponsored lecture we did, we spent about, six thousand dollars on right. the whole thing right that's like almost 10 percent of our entire <laughs> budget right and we showed up we we're all excited two people showed up to it oh. right 
we're like, oh crap, oh, no. <laughs> so soon. Um, but here's the good news about that. We did the lecture and one out of two bought into the product right away oh, and yeah. got it and all that. We're like 50% conversion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Totally, we're super excited. He was our first customer and he still buys product till today. He was uh, uh, almost regularly, almost every two weeks. And so then the, we're like, nope, this is the right move. You know, let's go to the next show. Let's do a sponsored lecture. Let's get people to the place. Let's run around the show, just roping people in the lecture. So the second one we did, we had about 12, 13 people. Uh, and then the third one we did in July, we had about 15, 25 people. And, and then people started talking about it, you know, yeah. because we were doing a very compelling lecture uh, that was titled forget what you think you know about probiotics oh i love it right yeah, yeah. disrupt when i just want to comment that about knowing you guys from the outside you know and we've known each other a long time your mm -hmm. sense of integrity is always there your sense of purpose and dri drive by the right things and and people are drawn to that like that's what i love about you love about the company um, and then the other thing is you had amazing science behind you, yeah. right? Like you knew, you knew you had a hole in one. It was just a matter of getting that information to the public. You can keep getting going. I just want to comment, like, so people listening know, like what I've always seen. And that's one reason why I've aligned and like spoke for you guys all over the place, because yeah. I still believe in your mission, your product and who you Thank are you. as, as human beings. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. And we wanted to change the game, right? The, yeah. One of the things that bothered us the most about most probiotics out there that people had access to was that people, companies just didn't do research on their finished product, right? And that was mind boggling to right, me. How right. You wouldn't want to do studies to know what your product does, right? You have to know that. And so we were, we were itching, we couldn't wait to sell enough so that I can work out a deal with a university and get a study going and get our first study done. Um, so we, we just kind of plowed through that way. You know, we, we went to every show we could afford to go to. We did lectures anywhere we could. Uh, we did, you know, uh, dinner lectures around Chicagoland area. And, and it just kind of swelled. It was, it was a very grassroots effort. We never took an investment money or any of that. It was completely grassroots. We went from the 80,000 to much more than that in a few years, um, you know, just plowing through with, the, with, with passion, to yeah. teach people that there's a better option out there and that this this uh, this approach is not really working and um, and we gotta we gotta look at things differently you know and so um, and then it, it, of course it became extremely exciting for us when we could start partnering with people like yourself mm -hmm. who could get the word out there you know people that are known and recognized and respected so uh, I mean it, it's been a, a really mind-boggling journey. And uh, we think back, you know, just a, just like three years, uh, even three years ago, I think we had something like 36 employees. Now we have like 110, wow. you know, it's, it's been crazy, mm -hmm. but it's been, it's given us the opportunity to invest in research. Uh, we've now published, I think, 12 studies mm -hmm. and we've got about six others ongoing right now. Uh, and we're initiating five new studies um, so it, it's, it's amazing. We're, we're, we're living the, uh, the nerd fantasy dream. Uh, I'm so excited. And I love hearing, cause I've never really heard your whole journey. Uh, cause I jumped in probably about 15 or 60, I don't know when yeah. it was, but somewhere in the middle there. And, um, um, so I love that. And again, the beautiful thing is your passion, the truth behind your product that it really worked. And then clinical efficacy, like all of us who are out in the field, we know because we see all of a sudden there's something different, just like my Crohn's yep. experience 20 years ago. I don't know what this thing is, but it's different. Right. I had no idea. Now I'm like, which again is why I'm so partnered with you and with your mission, because I knew before I knew what it was, there's something different about this probiotic. Um, yes. So let's talk about, well, first of all, your uh, Keystone product Megaspore has been such a great hit. All my, I mean, so many of my patients take it successfully. Um, Let's talk just a little bit about like the, um, one of the things that always struck me as I'm teaching and when I saw your data on the diversity. So I always say diversity is king. If, if you're listening here and you don't know it, I always um, talk about, you know, back in the Ireland potato famine where there was this blight and all the potato crop was wiped out all across the land. It was because all the farmers chose one seed. It was the best yielding product. They planted all the same thing. And then that blight wiped everything out. And the same thing with your gut flora. If you don't have diversity, if you don't have number of species in, lots of different diversity that creates resilience and that really is the core of overall health and resilience is diversity in the microbiome now we're going to talk about spores in a second and how they affect that but what i want to say is 
there's been things that have been led, leading up to this, like the chemicals in our soils, like our soils are a reflection of the microbiome. I come from a farm and my brothers are all still on that farm. And we always reflect of how the dysfunction and the depletion of the soils actually start to reflect the microbiome. So all, all, often our babies are born into the world with a less diverse microbiome and they're just at a disadvantage. So when I think about what can increase diversity, of course, foods and variety can, but let's talk a little bit about megaspore and how it affects diversity, because this is something no other probiotic that I've ever known can can talk about or can claim. Yeah, absolutely. And and we were very thrilled when we we were able to show and prove that it did. Right. We we hypothesized for a while that it did, um, but until we had the data, it was hard for us to really go out there and really talk about it. Um, the idea behind probiotics helping with diversity always came from this idea of seeding the gut with all of these bacteria that are in these in the capsule. And mm -hmm. so people kept saying, well, that, that means you just need more of the right. different bacteria in the right. capsule. Then you're going to get more and more diversity. And, and the, the response to that is no, because right. you're talking about one genus here, right? Lactobacilli typically or bifidobacteria. Yeah. Your, your gut has two, 300 g different genuses. What about all those microbes, right? So really what, how we came about the idea that um, there's a likelihood that the spores can impact diversity is because of the way the spores function within the gut microbiome. They have this unique modulatory effect where they can go in, they can read the, the um, environment within the gut and they understand where to start tweaking balances among organisms, right? If there's an overgrown and prob problematic organism, they know how to sit around that organism and bring it down and they do it differently with different pathogens. So I'll give you an example. Um, let's say it is something like strep and there's an overgrowth of strep uh, within the gut. The, the spores will sit around the strep and actually produce an antimicrobial that the strep can't handle, right? So it'll actually bring down the growth level of the strep. Now, let's say it's C. diff and we did a study on Clostridium difficile with, with Cleveland Clinic. What we found was that the spores will sit around the Clostridium and they don't, put a, they don't create an antimicrobial because they don't have an antimicrobial that will affect the Clostridium. Instead, they chelate iron away from the, from the Clostridium, wow. right? So they use a chelating agent that they produce. They, they secrete that into that microenvironment and it starves the Clostridia because the Clostridia needs iron for its metabolic function. And it's mind boggling when you think about that, right? Yeah. Think about this bacteria going in, first of all, being able to identify problematic bacteria in a sea of trillions right? And then honing on, on that one and then knowing based on what bacteria that is, what tool to employ in order to control it, right? So because it has that kind of intelligence, a kind of intelligence that we don't have right. about our own gut, right? Our immune system finds it hard to do that kind of modulation, right? right? Um, we, we hypothesize that if they can know which microbes to control and bring down, they can likely do the opposite where, under, where they can understand the underrepresented organisms and find ways to bring them up, right? And sure enough, they do that. So diversity is not only a factor of how many organisms yes. there are, but it's the uniformity among the organisms as well, right? So, um, and depending on how you measure diversity, some, some indexes will try to favor really low represented in, uh, organisms so you can get a better diversity score. Others will just look at if you're if you're below a certain prevalence level, they don't even count you as an right, organism. Right, right, right. And so if if the organisms are really low levels, they're almost like they're not there because they're non functional. So then the spores get in. They see these poor organisms trying to uh, trying to struggle and 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 raise their levels up. They'll sit around them and they'll produce compounds that help them grow. At the same time, they'll compete with the organisms that are competing against them. So they'll change the environment and they'll modulate it and do all of this amazing orchestration to bring back diversity within the microbiome. And you think about like, okay, why the hell do they do that? Like, how do they do that? And why do they do that, right? It's, it's, it's a really mind boggling thought that they can do this for us. And it comes down to something called symbiogenesis, right? So symbiogenesis is a forced coevolution of different um, species that, that coexist mm -hmm. and are forced to coexist. And so they find a symbiotic way of, uh, of functioning. And so we- Is constantly... that in the realm of when we talk about quorum sensing? Because that's the word that's mm -hmm. coming to mind, same idea. And that's, you want to describe what that is to our listeners? Yeah. So quorum sensing is how the microbes can actually read each other's signatures. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so that's one of the ways that the, that the bacillus will know who is there and at right. what number. Kind right? of like a, a, a business card or something, right? Totally. Where kind of yeah. like exchange their numbers and like, hey, who are you and, and what are you doing here? Totally. And, and not only do they, can they tell who's there, they can tell how many. Yeah. Right? It's quantifiable for them too. So they can, they can uh, for example, look and go, oh, okay, there's a pathogen there, but there aren't too many of them. So we're not going to bother with those pathogens, right? And, and in fact, uh, individual strains use quorum sensing as a way to mount a attack. For example, take listeria. Listeria is a foodborne illness bacteria, uh, listeria monocytogenes. Um, but you can get exposed to listeria and not get sick because you didn't get exposed to a threshold level, right? So there's, if you get exposed to a certain given level, once the listeria gets in the gut, they all start talking to each other and they go, okay, guys, are there enough of us here? Yes, there are. Okay, now everyone turn on your virulence genes, yeah. right? Turn on your toxins genes because there's enough of us and we stand a chance, Toxin illness, yeah. uh, right? If there are not enough of them, they don't turn it off and they're reading each other's chemical signatures so they know exactly how many of them are there. So that quorum sensing is a really important language that the bacteria have. And then there are some researchers that are trying to figure out how to listen in uh, on the quorum the language. Conversation, right? right? Totally, well, yeah, because there are bacterial well, conversations happening. One thing you mentioned that for people who are listening, maybe aren't super into the microbiome like you and I are, I want to go back to Clostridia. So if you're listening, you may have heard someone who has C. diff colitis or, or some sort of a Clostridia infection. What this is, is basically as we take antibiotics and destroy some of the good guys in the gut, the Clostridia, we all have some of them, and some of them are very good and healthy, but there's certain strains like C. diff or Clostridia difficile that can actually cause a colitis or a severe illness. I mean, older people often die of this illness, and it usually is antibiotic induced or iatrogenic, we call that like doctor induced because they've been given too many things and it depletes the diversity so badly. And spores, I always call them like tulip bulbs. When people are talking about spores, I'm like, it's like bulbs. They like sit dormant in the winter and then they blossom. So the spores, and I want you to talk the more technical terms about how this spore actually like doesn't need refrigeration and why. But again, in my simplistic form, I tell patients it's like tulip bulbs because they stay dormant. And again, in my very simplistic non-research mind, I'm like, well, spores and spores are going to be the best um, instigators of, of warfare against each other. So if we have a spore clostridia and antibiotics are, it's resistant to antibi antibiotics. And so it stays there and causes illness. Why not use a healthy, good spore, like some form of bacillus to actually be the, the counter attack there. And it sounds like that's what you're saying. One other interesting thing is as we have light, lots of glyphosate and Roundup in our environment, glyphosate preferentially kills some of the good guys, the other probiotics like lactobacillus, bifidobacter species, and actually allows clostridia to proliferate. And we've seen this in both horses and um, pigs and other animals, cows um, in their guts, where they actually have like a, a cow version of C. diff colitis because of the Roundup and the glyphosate on their feed. So we're seeing that in humans as well. So um, two things, I wanna talk just a little bit about like why don't they need to be refrigerated? And if that makes sense on the clostridia of like you were saying of why that might be a more helpful, beneficial. Um, and can these be like if someone's taking an antibiotic, are they somewhat resistant to antibiotics? Yeah, um, the, the, uh, the uh, bacillus, right? Are they, so yes, they are. They're resistant, in, not in the traditional sense where they have these antibiotic resistant right. genes, right? They're resistant in that if the environment around them is not ideal for growth, like there's an antibiotic around, they go in and they stay in the spore form and they just lay dormant yeah. and they wait, they're not metabolically active. And then when the levels come down, then they come out and start functioning. Um, so they, they like when you have a bottle that's on your shelf, are they fairly dormant until they get into the human body? Is that correct? So that's why okay. Yeah. So if you, if you took the megaspore bottle, the dried powder in the yeah. capsule, um, you could, you could let it sit on the shelf for probably 200 million years and it will still be exactly how it is until someone consumes it and it goes in and hits yeah. the, the small intestine, right? Uh, and there's evidence of that. And where did I come up with that insane number? Um, well, there's <laughs> the, some, some of the oldest bacteria ever found uh, was found actually in the in a deep cave in so Southern California in salt crystals, right? So well, what scientists have been doing, looking for clues of how to work around antibiotic resistant genes, they've been looking for new bacteria that humans have never discovered before because bacteria have new, uh, have capabilities of producing antibiotics. That's where most mm -hmm. antibiotics are, come from af uh, after penicillin. And so um, they were in these caves, they were sampling things to try to find new bacteria. 
and then they got these salt crystals out of the cave and then they melted the salt crystals out and they could plate out all these bacteria wow. that were in there. And, and the only bacteria that was still living in there that they could plate out were these bacillus spores and they were 250 million years old, right? Wow. Just sitting there dormant for that long and they could still grow them in the plate. They were still alive. Uh, there was another uh, example of it where uh, there was a fossilized honeybee in amber, you know, like in Jurassic Park, that little mosquito, they got fossilized, right, in amber. Yeah. Uh, but this was an uh, a whole ancient honeybee, and this is in South America, and they were able to drill in and pull out substance out of the honeybee's gut. Um, and they found in the honeybee's gut bacillus probiotic bacteria that were about 50 million years old and still alive in wow. that honeybee's, uh, ancient honeybee's gut. So these organisms have been here way before we have, right? They were here before the dinosaurs were here. Uh, in fact, they may be the, the, the origins of, of cellular life here on earth because there's a theory called panspermia that looks at where did the cellular components come from, right? Where did amino acids come from and proteins? Uh, where did uh, nucleic acids come from and so on? And when you, when you sample meteorites that come in from outer space, they have nucleic acids on them, they have proteins on them and so on. So uh, a, a bunch of scientists did studies to see, are there microbes that live on earth today that could have uh, traveled interstellar on a meteorite and actually make it on Earth. And sure enough, Bacillus subtilis was wow. able to survive seven years in inter interstellar travel. Wow, right? this is like science fiction right? stuff, it's real. So Bacillus subtilis, I love that. Okay, that's your new HG58. Again, it's not, it's an old, it's a 250 million year old product, but, right. but, new, like <laughs> but new here. But I wanna talk a little bit about that because I recently posted on some research you had shared um, on antiviral activity, which is, mm -hmm. So do you want to mention just a little bit about the power of, you talked a little bit about his antimicrobial activity, but specifically viral, I was really yeah. impressed. Yeah, so the, the bacillus has this amazing repertoire of capabilities in the human body. Um, you know, it, it's known for its antimicrobial capabilities, defending the body against pathogens. In fact, the NIH published a study um, about three years ago on 460 patients or so, uh, where they sampled people who had MRSA colonization throughout their body, right? The, the really dangerous yeah. antibiotic resistant um, uh, staff. And so what they found was that in anyone in the big population that they looked at, and this is the Thailand population that did not have MRSA, what they had instead was Bacillus subtilis. And if they did not have any Bacillus subtilis, they had MRSA growing, wow. right? So that was the only organism they found on these individuals that was associated with not having MRSA. If you had adequate colonization on, in and on your body by Bacillus subtilis, you had no MRSA. And so they, they published a study and said, this could be a very important probiotic to combat some of these important drug resistant exactly. uh, really yeah, bacteria, yeah. right? So then on top of that, so now they can protect us against all kinds of drug resistant bacteria. On top of that, they have a number of antiviral compounds. And they have antiviral compounds that, has been, that have been shown to fight against things like influenza, um, and no, not COVID-19, but uh, other coronaviruses they've, they've tested. Um, they've, they've looked at a number of different respiratory viruses and so on. So they pr produce these like leavens, they produce these surfactants uh, when they're in and on you that have direct antiviral activity. Wow. So they're protecting the host the whole time. So that's where that symbiogenesis relationship comes from, where um, there's this beautiful, um, uh, you know, mingling of the two different kind of organisms, which is us, the host, and then them. So for millions of years, we've said, okay, we're gonna eat you. We're gonna give you a home. Our immune system doesn't attack you. Yeah. So we're letting you be but you need to do some things for yeah, us in return, right? <laughs> exactly. And they go, and then the spores went, okay, we're going to clean up the house, right? Yeah. We're going to do all the housekeeping work. We're not going to let any, any other bugs come in here. We're not going to let viruses, bacteria invade the host. We want the host healthy because the host becomes their home. That's how they know to increase the diversity in the host. That's how they know to find and fight against problematic organisms, even defend us against uh, things like viruses and most recently help us detoxify things yeah, yeah. like poisons yes. that are in our system, right? Bacillus septilis has been shown to be able to break down um, organic-based uh, uh, pesticides like yeah. glyphosate, yes. like, like Roundup. 
Yeah. Uh, and most recently, there was a article I just sent to my team um, showing that um, arsenic and other heavy metals uh, can be actually sequestered by these organisms. Um, and then, uh, you know, plastics can be broken down by these organisms. Um, and so they have a whole host of protective effects. Oh, another one, uh, DON, which is a which is a really powerful mycotoxin, right? And that has all kinds of autoimmune uh, implications for people. Yeah. It's a massive trigger. Bacillus subtilis is at least two studies showing that wow. it protects against the effects that DON creates, right? So well, it's I, an amazing. I, love, I mean, I, the, yeah, the sky's the limit. And getting clinical practice. So I'm a clinician. I see patients every day. And that's where the rubber meets the road, right? You can talk research all you want. And I love that. But then I'm like, okay, is it going to work? So my clinical experience, Megasporce five strains, love it. It's amazing. And what I've seen in people with SIBO and CIFO, and for those of you who don't know, this is bacterial overgrowth in the small bowel, many, many causes. I won't go into that all today. And CIFO is fungal overgrowth. And mm -hmm very, very common now to have either both or, or, or at least one or the other. Um, be, these patients often don't tolerate the old probiotics, the other types that are lactobacillus bifidobacter based. Um, they don't do well, they do worse. And that was me 20 years ago with Crohn's. I didn't do well with any of those and I didn't know why. Well, now I know why, but uh, they almost always tolerate, Megaspore is my first go-to, but it, even if they don't tolerate that in, in the initial phases, the bacillus subtilis, I love because even my most sensitive patients, I don't think I have had one in my clinical experience that hasn't tolerated the HU58. It's currently what I'm on. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanna know um, the secret, I love it. Um, and the other thing that's so interesting is just, um, it really does help with SIBO and SIFO. And like I said, the, often I see mold patients, so I, I feel like they do a lot better. Now, one other just thought, I have no clinical experience with this, and I'm gonna step outside the box and ask you if you've seen anything. I have these patients with colonization up here with bacteria and fungus and everything. And I'm wondering, have you seen any research or do you think it's possible to do some research on um, a, a, a nasal rinse with the bacillus subtilis? Because it makes perfect sense to me that it would help with the MRSA in the, in the sinuses. You're 100% correct. Um, in fact, we're working with, a, with an ENT group in Canada right now where we are setting up a, um, a nasal rinse study using the bacillus. Send We've me had, that info when you get it done and publish because I want to. Absolutely. You know, and, and when talking to the ENT group, they said it's all strep and staph. You yeah, know, that's exactly, exactly. Uh, up there. And, and, and we know that bacillus does a fantastic job of competing against strep and staph. And then not only competing against strep and staph as bacteria one-to-one, -one, but it they also enhance the immune system's ability to recognize those organisms. Yeah. Right, so bacillus has this amazing um, immune activation role. They can activate something called toll-like receptors and toll-like receptors activate something called pattern recognition receptors. So what that means is um, in the simplistic form is that bacillus will come and it'll find a, a, let's say a bacteria here that's problematic and it'll tag that bacteria for the immune system to go, hey, you gotta pay attention to this and learn what this bacteria looks like. Right, that's a process called immune tutoring. And yeah. in fact, we count on bacillus to do that in early uh, stages of life because there are studies that show that babies who are exposed to bacillus actually develop uh, the gut associated lymphoid tissue much more profoundly than and babies. And let's be that clear for listeners that's dirt. So, babies and children who actually play in the dirt or eat a carrot out of the garden. This is the training of the immune system. I have a, a friend who, you know, hand sanitizer. Well, of course, nowadays hand sanitizer. This is before our pandemic, and her poor children were sick all the time because they had never touched dirt. So, <laughs> I just want to clarify. One hundred percent. It makes all the difference in uh, in in babies and what happens to them long term. Right. The the risk for allergies, asthma, all yeah. of those things increase and increase more. And in fact, it's it's um, there's a Finnish allergy study that really illustrated this. Uh, for them, in, there was a there was a big problem occurring in Finland, where, like in the U.S., asthma and allergies were becoming an epidemic among kids. Right in the U.S., it's somewhere around 10 million kids that suffer from pretty bad asthma, um, and so same thing was happening in Finland. However, about a hundred something kilometers down the road was a town in Russia, mm -hmm. so almost the same geography, and yeah. they had much lower allergy rates there. So then Finland said, well, what the hell's going on? You know, we need to do a big study to figure out what are the differences. So they went through everything and some of the big things they've found that, that made a huge difference in the rates of allergies in the two areas 
is in the Russian town, they kept the doors and windows open a lot more. So they got a lot more of the outside air into the house. Mm -hmm. They did not sterilize their surfaces, right? They did not have that Right. clean is associated with that bleachy smell, right? Um, and, and they did the opposite in, in Finland, right? The, a lot more doors and windows closed, more air conditioning, more sterilized surfaces. And that in itself made a huge difference. And then because, uh, you know, you can do this in, in these kind of progressive places, uh, Finland said, okay, this data is clear enough where daycares need to have dirt pads. And so okay. they they started building daycares with gardens and just yeah. dirt pads and, and made it mandatory for kids to play in the dirt throughout the day for X number of hours, right? And they started comparing those kids to kids yeah. who were through the normal daycare setting. And they started to see a massive change in the allergy and asthma rate, right? Just that simple. Um, and again, it's just become, it's just coming back to the basics. And, and that's how we looked at probiotic development, right? I, I told you, I went back to my evolutionary uh, biologist closeted days and said, what is the simple way that we get exposed to organisms and, and where can we find these organisms? So it's, it's really mind boggling when you think about how simple some of this stuff can be, but we've very much complicated it. Uh, oh, you know, but yeah, we need to dirt, and because of that, um, there have been products in the market, just soil based, and there have been a few concerns about safety. Um, tell us for the pe people asking that question, because yeah. your, your strains are researched and, but tell us the difference between just regular soil based with like tons of things we don't really know. And, yeah. and if there could be, cause I have seen some of that too, as well, where there could be an issue cause it's contaminated. Totally. And, you know, and it's very hard to mimic natural soil, right? Mm -hmm. um, you really can't because also what the question becomes, well, what soil are you right. mimicking, right? The soil over here in your front yard is completely different than the soil, uh, you know, in the woods when you go for a walk. Right. And, and so what, and what layer of the soil, what level of the soil, all of that. So this, the simplistic approach of let's just grab a bunch of bacteria in the soil and then use that as a probiotic just doesn't work because we don't know what those microbes are. We don't know what happens when you dose it right. like a supplement, right? Versus just getting um, transient exposure to it in the soil. Um, so that's the problem where, where we've seen uh, soil-based organism products that don't have a well-characterized um, you know, list of bacteria. And there are some in there that'll produce toxins and there are some in there that can be dangerous. And, and so you wanna be careful uh, by, by ingesting those. Now nature, if you're using nature's soil and you're going out for, for a walk in the woods, that area has been primed by millions of years of evolution with the ecosystem around it, right? So it's a different thing than trying to imitate that uh, in a and concentrate it and capsulize it and yeah exactly really it's it's the same thing to me like um the the analogy i give it's like baby formula right um since the mid 1800s companies have been spending hundreds of millions up to billions of dollars trying to mimic mother's milk and they've never been able to right even today after billions of year uh, billions of dollars and hundreds of years of research the biggest companies in the world, the Johnson Johnsons and all that cannot imitate mother's milk. Mother's milk is mammalian food that's perfected by evolution. It's incredibly complex. It has over 200 different prebiotics in it. It has upwards of 600 different microorganisms in it. It's so complex that there's no way we can try to imitate that. And that's why if the baby doesn't nurse and the baby does uh, bottles instead, um, you know, for, for most of the, of the uh, first year, you see a big difference in the yeah. health of the baby, right? Uh, so by that same way, we cannot imitate the soil. So what we did instead was try to hone in on at least one component of the soil that would have a direct probiotic effect. And then, and then look and see, is that going to really, uh, you know, move the needle for us? Yeah. Amazing. Um, so in the last few minutes, what are some of the cutting edge new things that are coming out? Tell us about either new products, new new research, what's the latest that um, would be interesting to know? Yeah, you know, so one of the areas that we're really big on, which which actually is quite relevant right now is the whole area of mood and sleep, mm -hmm. right? Um, so stress management, um, you know, improving theta waves in the brain, like how can we do that? How can we put people in a better state of mind to deal with stress? Obviously we can't do anything as a company to remove stress for people, right? Stress is a normal part of life. 
But the question is, can we deal with it better? Can we put them in a state that helps them deal with it better? Can we put them in a state where the stress is not so detrimental to their health? Mm -hmm. And then can we also put them in a state that allows them to sleep better in the evening and, and so they can recover from the day's worth of stresses and all, and all of that. So that's a big component and that's a gut brain connection issue. Now we have been focusing on the spores with LPS, uh, lipopolysaccharide and endotoxemia, that type of leaky gut is a big driver of mismanagement of stress, right? Because LPS interferes with serotonin binding, dopamine binding, it increases inflammation in the, in the dorsal vagal complex. So it screws up the communication between the gut and the brain. So it's a big uh, menacing issue in dealing with stress, mood, and, and leading to things like anxiety and depression uh, and disrupting sleep as well. So we said, okay, we've got that part covered, but there's another component. There's another component that is, uh, that's called elevated basal inflammation, which is stress-induced inflammation, right? So this is stress, this is inflammation that comes about from short bouts of stress throughout the day. Right, that is, you're driving the car and somebody cuts you off, and you're like, ah, and you honk the horn, and you throw the finger at each other, right? You get that elevated stress. Yeah. That single bout of stress actually will make a measurable change in your microbiome for a short period of time. And that single measurable change will actually lead to activation of macrophages, mm -hmm. uh, release of NF kappa B, activation of the HPA axis, release of cortisol, activation of the sympathetic system. This whole cascade occurs. And every time that occurs, it primes the body for more stress response, mm -hmm. right? And so we were thinking, okay, is there a microbiome solution to reducing that impact and reducing that release of cortisol when you encounter a stressful situation? And sure enough, there is. We got to work with a fascinating strain. It's called Bifidobacterium longum 1714. What's unique about this Bifidobacterium that you don't find on any other Bifidobacterium longums is that it has a outer layer called a exopolysaccharide. And again, there's a theme here, right? So we love the spores because of their weird little yeah. spore coat, uh -huh. but this Bifidobacter is unique because it has this coating on it called an exopolysaccharide. Mm -hmm. And as it turns out, that exopolysaccharide component has the ability to dramatically reduce basal stress-induced inflammation. Wow. And so what the studies have shown, and there are a number of published studies from uh, the, the most well-renowned gut brain research institute, which is in Cork Island, um, that they, they've got a number of studies showing that when you take this species, you dramatically reduce cortisol release. Uh, you, in fact, increase theta, theta waves in the brain. You actually improve sleep. So you, so you shorten the time to sleep. You increase the duration of sleep and you improve the quality of sleep. And it dramatically improves the ability to deal with stressful situations. Wow. Right. So then it's when you it's interesting because as a pl practitioner, we're thinking like phosphatidyl serine, magnolia, mm -hmm. honico, all these things. And now you're saying, no, actually probiotics might be our next game changer for reducing cortisol. That's totally so exciting. Is because this it, not on the market yet? It, 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 so it will be. Uh, we're going to have it in the market by the end of May. So okay. we've been chugging forward really hard on this yeah. because we're like, people need this. You know, people really, really need Especially this. Now. <laughs> As, especially oh. now, right? We've all gone through this highly stressful, you know, yeah. one and a half years or more, um, you know, and hopefully things are getting back to normal, more normal, but, you know, the yeah. world is a stressful place to begin with. And, and what the studies show is that, um, that those short bouts of stress really activate macrophages um, and those activated macrophages create this long-term inflammatory response in the brain that keeps triggering the, the HPA axis, right? So we keep releasing these glucocorticoids and keep forming cortisol. And that's why for people, it becomes harder and harder to deal with stress, right? So uh, remember when you were, you were younger, you could deal with stress a little bit better. And then as you get older and as time progresses, things stress yes. you out much easier, right? And, and stress it becomes resilience harder. goes down. Yes, exactly. Totally. A hundred percent. And that's because our system keeps rotating and yep. keeps priming towards mm -hmm. the, the glucocorticoid uh, cortisol release mechanism, right? And, and the studies show that we can actually bring it back. 
I always say it's like back. ruts in the old wagon wheel ruts that our brain mm-hmm. just ruts and then our wheels just go into the rut and we do the same path over and over and over again until totally. something changes. So potentially May, well, we'll stay yep. tuned. And you guys, if you listen here, you'll, I'll be sure and share. Do you have a name for it yet? Or is that? Uh, yeah, we have two. So there, there's two versions of the product. Mm-hmm. Um, the Zen Biome Cope and Zen Biome Sleep. Right. So the sleep one is is formulated with things that, that help you sleep yeah. uh, as well. Not not melatonin, but other sure. herbals. Um, and then and then the, the cope is a, is the daytime stress management. It's profound. Right. Oh. And then you combine it with the spores where you're already releasing uh, dealing with the right. LPS. Between the two, it's an amazing yeah. one-two punch. So you could give them the patients; they could take them both, no problem. Um, Absolutely, but- yeah. So take them both, um, and and we really want to improve people's state of mind because that to us is a is a critically important role of a company like ours, and yeah. we want to give them give them that at the foundational level, right? There's yeah. lots of people that can train you how to deal with stress and all that. Like you get probably give your patients lots and lots of tools of how to manage and mitigate it and all that. What we want to do is do it at the foundational level where the stress gets turned on uh, and start turning that switch back the other way. So that one is super exciting for us. That. And nowadays we need all those. We need the mind, body, the meditation, the, the yep. walking in nature, and then also the probiotics. This is so exciting. Now totally. we didn't even get to um, bovine immune globulins and all yeah. this amazing stuff. I'll be sure. And if you're listening here, any platform will link up to all the great products. Maybe we could just end with, um, I've been a huge fan of bovine immunoglobulins. Do you want to yeah. say a bit about that and about the power of what is that? You've got mega IgG, mega mucosa. Um, tell us just a little bit about bovine immunoglobulins. Yeah, I love those. So it's, it's an amazing array of IgG antibodies that you get to have. Uh, what, what's been happening is the cows have been working, their immune system has been working very hard to produce a array of, in, of IgG antibodies against all kinds of stuff that they encounter in the outside world, right? So against mold toxins and environmental toxins and viruses and bacteria, all of these things that trigger toxigenic response and inflammatory response in us. So then we, if we get the, uh, the, the serum from the cows and then we spin out and we purify the immunoglobulins, we've got a bunch of these amazing um, antibodies that we can now take and, and what they do is they'll go in and they coat the gut and then they start binding and neutralizing yeah. all of these things in the gut. And studies with H. pylori and viruses and other bacteria, yeah. like, name it. I, I don't know what all, I mean, I've seen for sure H. pylori and other bacteria, yeah. other viruses, but they really have a power to neutralize these, don't they? They do. They neutralize it and take it out of the system through defecation. So those things don't trigger inflammatory responses in your system, right? And what what really excited me about this particular product and the way we even met the company that we partnered with for it is they were involved in a number of HIV studies because um, the NIH published a paper, you know, back in 2014 showing that the biggest driver of mortality in HIV was leaky gut, or they called it HIV enteropathy, right? So that's the, the increased permeability in the gut lining. And they in fact showed that you can measure mortality uh, risk better with how permeable their intestines were versus how much virals, virus they had, mm-hmm. right? Which is mind boggling that the NIH published this study. And so they, they put out a challenge for HIV researchers saying, you need to find solutions to deal with this massive permeability issue that occurs in this disease. And so this company jumped in and they did two or three really well done studies with one of the top HIV researchers here out in the Midwest, Dave Asmuth, I think is his name, um, and, and what they showed is even under very stressful compromised conditions like HIV that have really bad leaky guts, this immunoglobulin was able to neutralize and bring down inflammatory responses and help those guts actually heal. Um, and so the lining of the guts, reestablish the lining of the gut. So under that kind of condition, if it can help, you know, under the kind of condition that most of us are facing from just the toxins and everything we're exposed to, it really does a profound job. So it's it's one of my products that I, I never forget to take. I There's really two or three things that I'm always on. And, you know, the other things I like keep forgetting and need to take it back. Yeah. But, the, but the immunoglobulins, the, the mega spore or the HE58, yeah. I switch between the two. 
Um, and then the, the K2, I take K2 all the time. But I, I agree with you. The Myomax and the yes. H258 and the IgG are my three. I totally agree with you. So and when Zen um, Biome comes out, I'm going to be on I know. I can't uh, wait. Sure. Oh, Kieran, I, I was excited about this, but this is even, I'm so excited about your new product and I am just so grateful. I know our listeners have so many um, comments, questions. People are really um, excited to hear this. And so when we get your new product out, I will, um, if you're listening here, I'll be sure you'll find it <laughs> wherever you find me, you'll, you'll hear about it. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your dedication and all your work to this industry. You've really moved the needle in the probiotic industry. And that's exciting to think about. That's really not that many years to have done the change made the impact that you have. And what you've given is for someone like me in clinical practice, you've created a tool for me to help many more people. So thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart for all the work you've done. And thank you for taking time to talk to me today. It, it was an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for all your continued support. Uh, we look forward to doing more things together. I'm super excited for you guys, for you and your, your patients who try the new products coming out and, uh, you know, happy to come back again anytime you want me. So uh, would well, love to website do it. is, we'll be sure and link that, but you can actually say yep. it because they're listening. Yeah, right? microbiomelabs.com. If people want to come, there's a lot of resources on there as well. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, we sell our products only through healthcare practitioners like uh, Dr. Jill. And so you can gain access to the products through your healthcare practitioner. Um, but you can come to our website. There's lots of resources on there to learn about the microbiome. Yeah, uh, there's a great, what, this website is amazing. So if you want more information, microbiomelabs.com and I will put link products. You can get those at drjillhealth.com. There's Megaspore, H-E-58, Mega IgG, Mega Prebiotic, um, Mega Mucosa. Um, and now the other one we didn't even talk about, but I'll leave with this one, the Mega Omega. Yes. I love this, the anti-inflammatory fish oil. So check that out, Mega Omega. Um, Kieran, thank you again. What a pleasure it's been. Thank you so much.